Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace, reporting live at this year's 2022 Downtown Jamaica Jazz Festival, presented by the Jamaica Center for the Arts and Learning here in downtown Jamaica, Queens. Blessing the band stage this year is soprano and alto saxophonist Yoslani Terry, who hails from Cuba. Now, for over 20 years, this gentleman has really laid his roots down, playing and backing and recording and touring with the likes of the great Jeff Tane Watts, Steve Coleman, Eddie Palmieri, and the great Roy Hargrove. Now, this gentleman, while in America, has continued to one express and communicate his rich Cuban roots by way of his music and black American music. Tonight you're going to see highlights of him performing with his ensemble, but we also sat down and we talked about, one, why it's very important for him to teach the Afro-Cuban aspect of his roots to musicians as well as his students at Harvard University, as well as talk about how he found his voice here communicating both voices, as well as sit down and talk and reflect on some of his musical influences, which include his father, who is a very, very famous Cuban band leader in his native Cuba. So sit back, relax, and enjoy highlights of Mr. S so sit back, relax, and enjoy highlights of saxophonist and educator Yoswani Terry performing live at this year's 2022 Downtown Jamaica Jazz Festival, presented by the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning here in downtown Jamaica, Queens.
you know, it's been a while. It's been a while since I've seen you and a lot of people here, man. How does it feel to be back on the stage now that everything is back open or opening? No, no. Well, to be back on stage is, uh, I mean, it's a great feeling, especially since we haven't been playing almost for two years. So to me, always the thing that I, I, I worry the most is the, the reflexes that you built playing together in a band. And those are the worst ones because just yeah, you can practice at home, you can you know check this tune and the other, but this is something else. When you play with someone else, now we're talking about community, we're talking about a uh, communication, we're talking about uh, exchanging and speaking a language and interplaying and all of that. All of that you cannot we cannot reproduce that by ourselves at, at, at home practicing. So uh, the feeling is just incredible. It's just a, it's a joy. And you don't realize, I mean, you knew, you knew, I mean, we knew about it, like how important music and art was in the world, but then at the time that no one had that, uh, it was when you were like, oh, yes, we're missing something that's important for society, and it's more important for the community. How did you musically, how did you regroup during these last two years? with the exception of you teaching, being that was really kind of the only commune musically that you were handing down as far as being a, a professor. But as a musician, did you write? Did you shed a little harder or did you stop and did you reflect? How did you, how did you do these two years? I think it was a combination of a lot of different things. At the very beginning, all of us and myself included were thinking, oh, this is the time to compose and let's just like, get some music ready so that when we come out of this we have a lot of a full repertoire to record then there was something that i was clear from the very beginning and i knew that at least we were going to be off for a year and a half whenever i would i would bring up to someone say just wanted this is too much uh, so as a result yes you start practicing you start trying to compose some music but in my case the this you know the the side that was a little bit of the discouragement was like when you write music, when you compose music, you're hoping to premiere it. And that, uh, the possibility of premiering any music was not there anymore. So you, I stopped composing for a little while because I said so. I started you know, meditating on, on the possibility of when this music was going to be premiered, who was going to hear, hear it, and what type of venue was going to perform. So uh, yes, I did some progress, and and then I, I I started reflecting and see, you know. I started doing more research, especially from for a different project that I'm involved now, which is like composing an opera. Uh, so then I, I channeled all of the creative uh, energy through the research with the, um, the other members of the. Um, creative team, in this case, uh, Teresita Fernandez, a uh, visual artist, and also Barbara Martinez Ruiz, who's an, uh, an African art historian. And, you know, we were inspired by the story of Jose Antonio Ponte uh, from a book written by Professor Ada Ferrer, who just won the Pulitzer Prize with her book, uh, Cuba, History of American History. Uh, and it's about this Apostle Antonio Ponte, it's a, a free black in Cuba who organized the first uh, rebellion against the colonial system. We're talking about the 19th century. So, of course, inspired by the Haitian Revolution and the French Revolution as well. So, uh, it's one of those characters that has been almost forgotten or, or silenced or, you know, we don't hear about him a lot. So, you know, using the pandemic to research, using the pandemic to to think about ideas that then I could develop once we get out of it.
your whole musical career has been one steeped into your very rich Afro-Cuban roots by way of your native Cuba, but also African is definitely part of your your musical trajectory also and then also black american music by way of jazz it's kind of like we've got this and the caribbean is always about the big melting pot how did you and how are you still finding your voice with traditional black american music fused with your native music how do you keep that moving i the beauty of this music of jazz and uh, creative music uh, and even African and Cuban music is like there's always voice for originality. Um, one of the things that I learned from my heroes, both in American music and Afro-Cuban music and African music, uh, is like you have to be you, 100%. And you have to, you need to have your own ideas. You need to have, of course, you need to know the tradition, you need to have inspiration from the elders, but they're always pushing you and remind you, reminding you that you need to be yourself. So, as you said, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a huge country like the U.S., and within the jazz tradition where like, now belongs almost to the world, you know, because it's like you hear jazz everywhere in every corner of the world. Uh, but I get the same uh, influence from this, that bird was bird. One note you know is bird. The same with Wayne Shorter, with Train, with Sonny Rollins, uh, with Dexter Gordon, with Herbie Hancock, Tommy Flanagan, Wenton Kelly, Duke, you know, it's like even uh, Nat King Cole. You hear one, you say, no, this is Nat King Cole. So what you get from them is that you hear that they have this enormous wealth of knowledge of the culture and respect for the culture, but they're always pushing to do something new. And this is also part of African music. It's like even when you're when you're singing, when you're drumming, when you're learning melodies, part of the process is to add your little bit and to be to start, you know, the improvisation side of it is within the the traditions within the community. So it's like you're expected to learn it, but you're expected, you're expected to expand it. So I firm, I mean, I firmly believe that um, one of the most important and inspiring aspects of jazz is uh, originality, hmm. and it's also be creative and pushing the boundaries because that's what I learned from all of them. They 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 were able to do whatever they want musically. But they were always trying to create something new, like search in search for something, you know. Um, I tell a lot to the students because it's like this, because I'm often this music is part of an oral musical tradition. So when it's been codified and, and taught through through the you know like high learning uh, institutions, sometimes not all of the professor teaching there have the knowledge and the information of the community. They have not learned it from the horse mouth or they have not been brought up by a mentor to learn this music. And I don't care how much note you play, I don't care how much technically clean you are. If you don't have anything to say that is you, then to me it doesn't make sense. Because it's like, what are you doing? Yes, it's like you're playing notes. Notes doesn't really represent anybody. Notes are notes. A C is a C, a B flat is a B flat. When you combine it, you can do this scale. But it's about emotion, it's about character, it's about how do you hear, it's about how you can communicate. It's a vocabulary. So you need to learn how to speak it and how to, how to use it to sound yourself. I saw a video with your father, God rest his soul. You went home and you explained not only the origins that your father implemented musically to you, but there's, like you said, there's an oral story with the music of your native Cuba. I want to know how and why classical music is always the start point for all musicians. Because it, that's such a European art form. Then it's, it's European and 
Black American music by way of jazz, blues, gospel, hip hop, funk, it's a different language. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're at a point now in, because you're, you're an instructor, do you think that now the universities are now chiseling away from European learning and moving towards American roots music by way of black American music as well as the, the Caribbean? I think this is, a, well, that's an important uh, point of view which I've always uh, embraced. Especially, I was the result of someone that started learning music from a European perspective because I started with the violin. So when you start in violin, everything that you play, I mean, the violin is such an old instrument that it has, so, so you, have to, you have to actually practice classical music. But I must admit that my first uh, exposure to the music was not European, was uh, Afro-Cuban music and was Cuban music, like, like popular Cuban music. So that was at the beginning at the same level. Now, the point that, you, that you're making to me is really important because when you are trained only in European music, there is something that is the most important part of part for our tradition, which is like imagination, curiosity that is being chastised and is not being paid attention to. So, and you can see the result with, with kids that they didn't learn classical music at the beginning. And they had a whole different relationship with the instrument. They have a whole different relationship and sensibility with how they feel music and how how they interact with people. And a different understanding of the language as well. Because they were naturally brought up in a, in a, in a, in a, in a community where there was not these elements of Europe in there. So I think schools are realizing that still the country is like heavily uh, Eurocentric and we're trying to move away from that uh, in a way, but we still have, have uh, places to go. At least I know that in the schools, uh, a lot of kids, they start with jazz. In primary school and all that, they start with jazz not all of them, I mean, not all, I mean, not all the parents can, can afford to have um, a private teacher that teach them like European music. So within our community, those things are still there, but again, the school is the one that dictates at the time. But I totally agree with you, understand that the huge difference that it makes when you start learning music, you start being exposed to music, from traditions that are completely different than European.
question about your father. Your father was a very, very important music figure in, in Cuba. And with the different types of Cuban music styles, how did he teach and hand that down to you musically and also through the history of it? And how do you differentiate the different music styles that your father did? That was something really, he made it really simple for us. Uh, well, he taught us to play checker at, at home, but also he, he, we started studying music when we were five years old. There was a private teacher that would come to the house and, and, and taught us violin. But also the best way for him to teach us, it was by exposing us to the rehearsal. So we used to go to the rehearsal of his band. And then there we were learning, oh, this is a dance song. Oh, this is a song montuno. This is a guaracha. This is a cha-cha-cha. This is mambo. So before you know, even though they're not stopping the rehearsal you know, to lecture about it, but you're learning those traditions. You learn like the cowbell here sounds different than in dance song. Oh, there's no dance song. There's no cowbell in dance song. But then for the cha-cha-cha, it's different pattern. And you learn to dance it. You learn to sing it, you learn to interact with it. And before you know, and also the fact that you're looking, you, I mean, especially for us that we were in love with music, we were really curious, we were paying attention how things uh, were done during the rehearsal. So I think that was really important. And then sometimes he just sat down and taught us, okay, this is how you how you play the guitar in the dance, one of the most important instruments in the dance. This is how you how do you play the, um, how you do a piano montuno when you're playing a song or when you're playing a cha-cha-cha. This is a different pattern. So we were, in that sense, we were home school with all of the, I mean, with the, with the vast uh, wealth of traditions that exist in Cuba since early age. So it's a, it was a privilege to have someone that was, you know, a celebrity in the country, but at the same time, happened to be our father, and he was just passing down a lot of information since we were little kids. Did it help you tremendously when you came to the United States? Because you were so rooted in, in Cuban music, in, in your culture. Did it, was it a culture shock when you came to America and started playing with the heavyweights like Eddie Palmieri and Henry Trey? Because I, I know that we have a very different lingo mm -hmm. when it comes to interpreting the music. Right. How did you feel it was segueing when you came here? Well, I wasn't into, into jazz, American music, Brazilian music since I was in Cuba. I mean, like the three cultures, more important popular culture in the world are American, Brazilian, and Cuba. Those are the three cultures that export music throughout the world. You can go to anywhere in the world with someone trying to imitate American music, someone trying to imitate Cuban music and Brazilian music. So in terms of popular music, so these are things that I was related with since I was little. Now, it is different when you come here and then you're learning from the horse mouth. And then someone that has, that was an architect of this music, then it's like passing that information. And remember when I first started playing with Tootie Heath, and, and because I started coming through a stand for Jazz Workshop during the summers, and I started coming in 95, you know, like playing with Tootie Heath, learning, I mean, learning how he felt the music. Also, being there with uh, Billy Higgins. Billy Higgins then, you know, passing that information. He even invited my band to play at his club at the time. It was like the. Um, the early 2000s, right? Yeah, but the name of the club in the community is like the World Stage. Okay. In in LA, so going there was like you know meeting Al McKibben, uh, and meeting all those like jazz great. But plus at Stanford Jazz Workshop, that was the first time that I met like people like Rufus Reed, um, McCoy Tyner, uh, Jimmy Heath, um, and. Ray Drummond, Clark Terry. I mean, well, this was huge. So it was like the first time actually seeing like the people that created this music, the people that have developed this music and developed the vocabulary and the language of the music. So the shock was going back to Cuba 
and how to explain to people that. So when you see the Ray Brown Trio, so the first two years that I went there, I was just seeing Ray Brown Trio. First time was like with uh, Jimmy Green and, jo and, and Gregory Hutchinson. The second year was uh, Gregory Hutchinson and um, uh, Jeff Kisser. But there was Ray Brown passing the information. I didn't miss any master class. And then when you hear that, I mean, then then in the sessions that I would be I would be playing in the jam session with uh, Gregory Hutchinson, which we became really friend, or with Margaret Miller. Uh, um, and you know, asking Margaret, you know, the best way to learn the songs and all of this is just to get the get the recording by Sarah Vaughan, to get the recording by Nella Fitzgerald. So then just started from singers because of this and this and this. Uh, so I mean, that was a a privilege to be able to hang out and learn what's more, more important from the jazz greats because it, it was through them that I actually learned a lot. Another person that was important was, uh, was also Steve Coleman. He was coming to Cuba, bringing a lot of music, and he noticed that we had been checking out the music, but he was the first one that said, no, you need to transcribe. It's good that you listen to the music, but you need to transcribe to know exactly what is happening. And then he would bring say, he would say, okay, this is what Bird is doing. So you have to do it. So those things were really important. Then when I moved here, I started practicing every week with Antonio Hart, with Robbie Coltrane. And I got together with a lot of different people. So uh, one thing that New York have is like if people notice that you're really interested interested in the music, they open the door for you, and they they see that you have no attitude. They you know. The impressions they share everything that they have. So I was lucky to be able to meet a lot of people from the community and then, you know, I start learning the music from them. But as I said, I started in Cuba, like Osmani Paredes, the piano player. We used to play jazz all the time. I had a, a, one of the saxophone teachers, he's a great jazz, jazz player. He's the first one that then introduced us to the language and vocabulary and the harmony. Then he taught us all the chords and everything, and then we used to, you know, come behind him. Uh, it was good because it's like I was learning all of the standards, knowing how to play in the piano, listening to him how to improvise, and then, you know, he was teaching us how to do things. So, it's a, um, it's a, it's something that was there that was like jazz radio there. You know, I, I used to, we used to have. Uh, Live for Brown record with Harold Land and, and all that. So we used to hear to all of the music. Then used to go to the National Library and then check all of the records. They have, you know, Miles, Dane. They have everybody. I mean, Wayne, Wayne and, and uh, Train. They have everybody there. So uh, or a lot of people from the before the '59 because that's when the the relationship was uh, cut off. So. Um, it's always been for me a, a, a curiosity, but more than a curiosity is the belief of, you know, of this music, creative music and jazz as a vehicle for expression. So to me, that's, that's the most important part. It's like, how can you be yourself playing the music that you like? Um, and how can you compose music that allows for representation when I see my community represented, when I see myself represented. So, I mean, it's like there was, yes, when I, I was playing classical music, which I love and I still play to today, I still play with classical musicians and all that. Um, but the opportunity for self-expression is more within interpretation. Uh, with this tradition, you have full agency to be yourself, full agency to compose in the moment. And this is something that it's like one of the, the, the most important gifts of this music to the world. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. Reporting live at this year's 2022 Downtown Jamaica Jazz Festival, presented by the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning. 
I'd like to personally congratulate and thank the incomparable Yosvani Terry for his time. Make sure you support his upcoming project as well as his club dates. For more information, please visit him online at yosvaniterry.com as well as visit him on social media by way of Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Also, I'd like to personally thank Rio Sakari for organizing and putting together this year's Jamaica Jazz Festival. You did a fantastic job. Also, I'd like to personally thank the staff and management here at the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning for your warm hospitality. As always, people, I can't stress this more than enough. Please like, share, and subscribe to my videos here on YouTube and Vimeo and leave comments, as well as visit my website, thepacereport.com, for my weekly column, as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Until next time, peace. Thank you.